This woman got sentenced to 120 years in prison, but don't you dare feel bad for her. This woman's name is Brandy Worley. She had a husband and also is the mother of two kids. But another thing is, she was cheating on her husband and her husband had finally had enough. He told her that he was going to divorce her. And she knew that if they got divorced, her husband would get full custody of their children because of her infidelity. This was something Brandy could not fathom. So she did the unthinkable. One night, after her husband was already sleeping in the basement, she snuck into her kids' rooms and cut their throats. And then she stabbed herself in the neck and called 911 and told them exactly what she did. When the police got there, the children were both dead, but Brandy was still alive. And they took her to a hospital and saved her life so she could stand trial. And in 2018, Brandy was sentenced to 120 years in prison. Serial killer facts you probably didn't know. Part 1. In the case of John Wayne Gacy, he crammed so many bodies underneath his house that they actually started to melt together. It took autopsy detectives almost two years to find out what bones belonged to what skeleton. Jeffrey Dahmer actually gave people sandwiches in his apartment building, which more than likely contained actual human flesh, but no one fully knows. The reason Jack the Ripper always unalived his victims by slicing their neck was because it was a way for him to never get blood on his clothes. Like and follow for more. At night, you really couldn't see all the details. But they cleaned him up really good when they examined him. But that's the original lion, too. The world's worst job, otherwise known as Sheehan or Sheen, however you pronounce it. Hi, my name is Ethan and let's get right into this. Recently I've heard a lot of rumors about how bad the Sheehan workers are treated each day, and honestly, nothing could have prepared me for what I learned. This all started in June of 2022 when a viral TikTok displayed articles of Sheehan clothing with handwritten messages stating, need your help. According to Brightly.eco, they state that the average Sheen worker works 7 days a week in 18 hour shifts. They even found that some of the workers were seen washing their own hair while they were at work just to keep up with their personal hygiene. Not only do they work a lot, but they also make a base salary of $556 a month to make 500 articles of clothing each day. Let me know what you guys think. Have you ever wondered how accurate police sketches are? I'm gonna show you a couple police sketches and then we're gonna see what the people looked like when they were actually caught. And I cover all sorts of true crime and spooky stuff on this page, so make sure you follow along. Starting with this one. So this was a man who SA'd a minor and this was the description that she gave to the police. And as you can see, this is really close. He has the big glasses that go up over his eyebrows, broad nose, really round face. Even the hairline is pretty similar. This is a woman who stole a baby from a maternity ward and she was actually caught 10 hours after the sketch was released because she looks almost identical to it. So the witness who gave the description to the police officer for this one was actually intoxicated when he saw her, but that person basically got it identically correct. You can see her wispy bangs, super round face, the way that her hair comes down over the sides of her face. Even her eyebrow shape is perfect. These sketches were all done by a woman named Lois Gibson who holds the Guinness world record for most successful police sketch artist. She helped solve over a thousand crimes in her 30 year career. blood-curdling facts that you wish you never knew, part 35. This creature is known as a woolly monkey, and due to poachers and people trading and selling them illegally, there's only a thousand of these little guys left in the world. The uncanny valley is a phenomenon in which people become fearful at things that are very close to human, but something isn't quite right. Throughout history, mummies actually weren't that rare, that is, until the Victorian British ate so many of them. 
During the Arctic exploration, one of the scientists was complaining that his shoes were soaking wet. Later, when he took them off, he found this was because his feet were decaying and liquidized with his blood. A man once donated his recently deceased mother's body for scientific research. Later, he discovered that the research facility sold it to the US Army for five grand, strapped it to a chair, and blew it up with explosives. Terrifying Interviews with Serial Killers, Part 1, John Wayne Gacy. And there are a lot of things I can't remember. The same thing with the victims. I've looked at all of, I don't know if you notice here, we got pictures of every one of the victims here. And believe it or not, for the last 12 years, I've studied these photos of these victims. We, we have a shot of all of the victims together here. And uh, when you look over at the, the photos, I have no recollection of any of them. Never met them. And we've gone over this more than once. They're just names and faces. And when you, when you look at them... The robber doll might be crazier what's, than, what's the than, robber doll? than the Annabelle doll. Robber Have doll. You, you've never heard of it? Is this like part of the conjuring shit? Just a cursed doll and it's in a museum in Florida, right? Yeah, yeah. But I'll tell you the whole backstory, right? Okay, okay. So a kid named Eugene, yeah. he got a present, like a life-sized human doll made out of straw mm -hmm. from his grandfather. Since it's life-size, Gene took it like wherever he went. Like everything he did, he did it with the doll. I'm like a best friend. Yeah, exactly. And nothing happened until like, I think a year into the doll being in his uh, presence. Yeah. That the grandpa and the grandmother started finding out some weird shit that was happening around the house. Like what? So in the middle of the night, right? Gene's door would be like creaked open. Mm -hmm. So whenever they passed it, they would hear Gene having a conversation with himself. Oh, right? shit. It's like a full on conversation. And this is the craziest thing. Yeah, yeah. There were two different voices. Yo, so Gene shit. and someone else. <laughs> yeah. In the middle of the night, Gene, one, one night, Gene screamed like crazy, right? Mm -hmm. And the grandfather ran in the room. And all you'd see, This is one of the strangest copycat crimes you will ever hear about. After the 9-11 terrorist attacks in New York City, there was a genuine concern that people would try to copy this attack. And although there were some attempts, most of these people were caught before they did anything. However, there was somebody who successfully stole a plane and flew it into a tower in America. This person was 15-year-old Charles J. Bishop. At the time, he was a student pilot, and on the 5th of January, 2002, his instructor left him alone in the plane to do the pre-flight inspection. During this time, Bishop took flight without permission and headed straight towards the Bank of America Tower in Tampa, Florida. He crashed directly into it and was killed in the process. Luckily, there were no other fatalities. Initially, officials ruled out terrorism, but inside the wreckage of the plane, they found a note written by Charles where he voiced support for Osama bin Laden and the 9-11 attacks. He also stated that he was doing this on behalf of Al-Qaeda. All of these insane facts are the reason that I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, for the forgiveness of sin. If you see another person that looks identical to you, run away and hide. In terms of serial killer captures, Gacy had easily one of the best. By 1978, Gacy had been killing for a long time. He ran a successful contracting company, and the victims were his own workers. Obviously, he was doing kids' birthdays as the clown. People around town knew this guy. Like, he put on different events, weaseled his way into local politics areas with the first lady. He was part of all these different social clubs, just a pillar of the community. Which is always a suspicious title to me. I don't know. I feel like on the suspect hierarchy, obviously, 
likely relatives, people with previous convictions, but also like keep an eye on the town community pillar. But eventually, multiple parents had come into the police station with the same story. My son's missing, he'd just gone off with this guy Gacy at his contracting business, so that led police to search his property, where they found some creepy sh** and also some really sus stuff like driver's licenses and personal items. But even despite finding some stuff, they didn't find any body, so they couldn't charge him. But they were very suspicious of Gacy now, so they started running surveillance on him and tailing him everywhere. But anyway, one night, Gacy's in his house, he must have looked out the window or something and sees the police, and with all the bravado in the world, struts outside and says to the officers, hey, uh, why don't you guys come on inside and join me for coffee? And they do. And while the officers come inside for coffee, one of the officers needs to use the bathroom. And while he's in the bathroom, the heat starts coming on and pumping air up, and something also came up. To the officer, the unmistakable smell of death. To Gacy, uh, that's just my house smell. You know, he's probably so accustomed to the smell of advanced decomposition that it didn't even register. That eventually leads to the second search, where they start digging up Gacy's crawl space, where they find over two dozen victims whose remains had, obviously, over a long period of time, melted together. Normal looking photos that have a disturbing backstory, part 27. This photo shows an elderly couple doing the hokey pokey with a man named Dennis Rader, also known as the BTK killer. He installed alarms for a living, and ironically many clients booked his services to prevent him from entering their homes. This photo shows Luchadora Wanavaraza. She was sold to a man for three beers by her mother until her stepdad found her at age 17. Over the years that followed, she would strangle and rob over 45 old women that reminded her of her abusive mom. The man in the background is Christopher Wilde, aka the Beauty Queen Killer. This picture was taken on June 15th, 1984, and Chris is scouting future victims at a beauty pageant. This photo shows John Edward Robinson holding a baby girl named Tiffany. Just one day before this photo was taken, he murdered the baby's mother and gave Tiffany to his brother, saying that she was adopted. His brother, along with Tiffany, didn't find out the truth for 15 years. One of the victims, when deputies arrived, was still alive. He immediately began CPR. Unfortunately, he died at the hospital. The victims are here. Eladio Peraz, 52 years of age. Marcos Peraz, 19 years of age. Jennifer Anaya, 49 years of age. Rosa Peraz, 72 years of age. Alyssa Peraz, 16 years of age. And Nicholas Peraz, 10 months of age. I'd like to make a correction. On scene that night, uh, we believe that the young teenage female was 17 years old. In fact, we later learned that she was 16 years old, and I believe I put out that she was 17. We also believe that the time that the infant was six months old, we later learned that it was 10 months old. So I want to make that correction for all of you today. She was 16, and the small infant was 10 months old. She was found, along with the infant, laying next to her mother, his mother down the street. We believe that the 16-year-old teenage mother and her small infant actually was fleeing and running from the scene. What we have since learned through forensics, that it was clear that the shooters stood over the top of the 16-year-old mother and fired rounds into her head. The 10-month-old infant also suffered from the same attack. None of this was by accident. It was deliberate. Intentional. And horrific. I will tell you this. We do know of three surviving victims from this, what we're describing as a massacre. Three. We will be interviewing them and collecting as much information as we can. There was one person inside the home hiding as they could hear the gunfire erupting inside the home. The description from him is that he was in such a state of fear that all he could do was hold the door, hoping that he was not the next victim. Detectives, at this point, we do believe that we are in the search for two known suspects. 
potentially a third in an escape vehicle, but we don't know that to be true. This is going off a hypothesis from law enforcement, but we do know that in fact we have two suspects. It is very clear that this family was a target and that there are gang associations involved as well as drug investigations with us in this home. But let me make this very clear. Not all these people in this home are gang members and not all of these people in this home are drug dealers. The 16 year old female is an innocent victim. The grandmother inside appears to be an innocent victim and definitely this 10 month old child is an innocent victim. I'll tell you a little bit of the history of the home. On January 3rd of this year, Tulare County Sheriff's Office patrol officers conducted what we call a parole compliance check. Basically what that is is when we uh, know people who are on felony parole and are in the community, uh, we will stop and make sure that they're abiding by the law. This compliance check done on January 3rd is the same home where the massacre occurred on Monday. This is a known home to our department. This is where gang activity has routinely occurred in the past. During that compliance check, deputies saw shell casings laying on the ground outside the home. When asked if we could go inside and search, they refused and that's where the search warrant was written. We obtained a legal search warrant from a judge and we were able to do a search warrant of the home. And we found Eladio Perez who was already on felony convictions, was in possession of ammunition, felon in possession of a firearm, felon in possession of a short barreled rifle, felon in possession of an assault weapon, a loaded weapon in possession of a firearm, and possessions of a controlled substance. He unfortunately was able to bail out four days later. So law enforcement doing their due diligence in community service and protection, part of our duties is to go into these homes and try to remove guns, drugs, and that type of activity. And this home was known to us. That's how I'm able to say that this is a gang-related activity. <clears throat> I have also been quoted as saying this was a cartel-like execution. Make no mistake, I'm not saying that this is a cartel, but also be clear that I am not eliminating that possibility. These people were clearly shot in the head and they were also shot in places that the shooter would know that quick death would occur. This is also similar to high-ranking gang affiliations in the style of execution that they commit. So we don't know if it is a gang affiliated shooting, a cartel affiliation, or if the two are combined. But what we can tell you is the manner in which this has occurred is definitely one of the two if not combined. As the investigation unravels and we're able to confirm one or the other, you will be the first to know. Detectives, as far as man hours. Detectives have been working 24 hours a day. And when I say that, I don't mean they go home at midnight and get back up again at 7 in the morning. We have investigators working literally 24 hours a day. With forensic analysis and the collection of forensics, we have our crime lab, digital forensics, our coroner's office, and property and evidence. There has literally at this been point been hundreds, hundreds of items of evidence collected. And we expect more items of evidence to be collected. As of this press conference, detectives are still canvassing the area, looking for surveillance videos, asking for the public's health help. And so here today uh, within this conference, I'm also asking for the public's help. Anyone in that area, if you have a business, it is an industrial area very nearby in the Goshen area, there are residences with ring cameras, there are video all over. Between the hours of 3 a.m. and 5 a.m., we're asking you to go back, take a look at your business videos. Go back and look at your home videos. Doesn't matter how far away you were from the scene. Any video evidence that you find suspicious, please contact the Tulare County Sheriff's Office. We want to look at it. Take the time to go look at your business video and your ring camera videos and report what you have and save what you have. I would also like to commend and thank the law enforcement community that has come out in support and offering assistance in this investigation. Behind me today, of which I receive phone calls within hours. 
from the ATF, FBI, Homeland Security, DEA, Department of Justice, and the California Department of Corrections. Every one of them called within hours offering resources and assistance. I have them with me today behind me. I have our investigators, our captains of investigations, but I also have those federal agencies. We are pulling out all stops. We are turning over every rock. Every bit of information in the community that you feel is suspicious or that you would like to give us, we want it. I received a phone call from U.S. Congressman uh, Jim Costas. He offered uh, victim support. He sits on a committee for victims of these types of crimes and have offered federal support for our victims. And we must remember we have victims. I will bring you up to date as our autopsies. Autopsies on the bodies have started today. They will likely be completed on Friday. That'll be part of the information in our next press conference that I'll be able to provide.